Hello and hello everybody, my name is Lucy and welcome to Books and Brushes. So today, this video is my April wrap up, although I'll also be covering a book that I didn't quite wrap up from March. So slightly March, slightly April wrap up. Again, not been super speedy, not been reading a lot, I've been busy. If you saw my last video, thanks. But yeah, let's get to the book that I needed to talk about at the end of March and then we'll get on to my April read. So the book I read in March that I didn't quite get to finish off talking about was The Rule of Three by Eric Walters. So this is a book that was gifted to me by my dear friend Matthew over at Matthew Reads and Writes and he basically pitched this to me as being similar to Dry by Neil and Jared Schusterman and if you know me at all you know Neil Schusterman is my favourite author of all time who wrote my favourite book of all time, Unwind, and I really like that book. It's about a world where there's no more water and society crumbles and this book has a very similar plot but it takes it in a very different direction so I definitely get the similarities between those two books. Matthew, you know nailed that comparison. So The Rule of Three follows a main teenage boy called Adam and he's in school when all the power just dies and nothing of modern technology is working and no one can quite figure out what's going on, why, how long it's gonna last and everyone's just over really confused. But Adam's mother is a police chief and his next door neighbour is an ex-military man who did something fairly top secret for the government and Adam ends up in the middle of the crumbling of society which happens because there is no power and all the necessities go, which turns civilization into a bit of a dumpster fire. So as I said, the ex-military neighbour next door, I think his name was Herb, or was it Hank? I think it was Herb. So Herb recognises from the get-go that things are going to go downhill fast, and Adam's like, we're a society, we're civil people, but Herb knows that without the necessities, the suburbia that they live in is quickly going to turn into a bit of a hellscape, so he immediately starts prepping for the inevitable disaster that's coming, and Adam gets through thrown along with all of that because his is the only car in town or one of the few cars in town that's still working because his is a really old car working on petrol whereas in a lot of the other cars are more modern with electricity so they've all died and because Adam's mother is the police chief she is the centre of everything that's going on and basically the authority of the neighbourhood to keep everything in line. I'm about to talk about some of the details of the book so if you don't want to know any more than that you can skip this over here. So no one quite knows what Herb does but they just know that it must have been something pretty top secret and he just seems to know everything that's going to happen and everything that he predicts starts to happen. So first of all he buys out a lot of iodine from the pool store which confuses everyone but of course it's for fresh water later down the line. Herb and Adam end up having to organise the supermarket to prevent a mob from happening and there's a lot of politics and people are trying to be civil but once people start realising they're not going to get the necessities they need for their families things get very edgy and people get very desperate which is is obviously where things go very badly wrong. Because the power's out, you've got no power, you've got no taps, you've got no trucks to come in and bring food, and when you're in a city, you're basically stranded. So Adam and Herb join up as a team to survive, and Herb wants to go out to the local farm and set up camp and defend, because he knows what's coming, whereas Adam wants to be more generous than that, and he wants to save the neighbourhood. So with his police chief mother, and with his retired ex-G man next door, Adam himself, who is a pilot, and who has a miniature plane in his garage that him and his dad built, because his dad is a pilot, the three of them kind of organise this community into being a self-sufficient island, and it is so interesting. Basically they convince the local farmer to come live with them, and they convert all the fields and the parks into farmland, and they have to grow their own food, they start digging wells, they start ripping out all the fences and build a perimeter around the neighbourhood. So so there's three pillars to make sure that this all works. It's farming, no one's got jobs to go to anymore so they basically all become back to basics farmers and they all have to pull all their food together and divide it into rations. There's security, so the police department are organising the security to help people inside not go for each other but more importantly to keep everyone else out and they completely become their own shut off island from the rest of the world and that creates such a moral dilemma for our characters because they can't let anyone in because people badly want to come to where they are because they're growing food and they have water but if they let people in then there's not going to be enough and the whole community will die. So that is like one of the moral dilemmas that they have to go through in this book. They're trying to save a community of like 600 people and keep those people alive but that of course costs. The people outside the fence can't come in and you have to turn people away, even families, and protect your neighbourhood from the people who will want to take what you have. 
And the book goes from there. I don't want to tell you everything that happens, obviously, because it's a brilliant book and I think you should read it. But I just found this whole concept and the way this whole book was written so fascinating and interesting to read. I love the planning aspect of this book. So a lot of the book focused on survival strategy and the psychology of disaster situations. And it was really fascinating. This is obviously a fiction book, but there's a lot of non-fiction elements. And you can tell the author really did a lot of research and loves this survival topic. At the end of the book there was even a whole bit on real life survival, what you should have in your survival kit in your car and things like that. It was just really interesting and this book really took this in a intellectual analytical direction. Obviously there was a lot of characters that all fit into their own places in this new society but I love the strategy and the planning and the community aspect, the fact that they were trying to make this one whole community survive and the way that civilization started so normal and suburbia and then got a little confused and then got a little edgy and then quickly descended into chaos. I love the way that worked and how Herb explained that from the very offset he knew all of that was going to happen and how they battled against it. So they built this community with the fences and they had to organise everything. They had to organise where they're going to build wells. They had to have anyone who's a builder who needs to rip up fences and build this and they needed to organise where all the, the plumbing what was going to happen with all that and there was a lot of organisation and how tactics going on in this book and some people might not like that, I don't know, but I loved it. <laughs> Fun fact about me, I'm a very analytical person. I love details, probably why I'm a realism artist, probably why I write down every book I read in every page and I love my book stats and how I write down every penny I literally ever spend and I earn. I'm just one of those people, you know, that just can't not with the detail. <laughs> if you're a person who loves like planning parties or organising things, if you're like me and you like that kind of thing or at the very least you like strategy and strategy board games or movies or video games or anything like that where you have to think and plan this is perfect for that i really really love this book it's very different to anything else i've read it does have those dry vibes but i've never read a book quite as analytical as this i don't know if that even makes sense this is a fiction book and there's characters and this is all made up and exciting and there's drama but i just love the planning and the intellectual aspect of it and i found myself really reading this book and really enjoying it and every time I put it down and walked away to go make dinner or whatever I kept thinking about it. I'd lie awake at night thinking okay if I was on the committee if I would found myself in charge in this society like what would I do? What would everything you'd need to think about? How would you organise this neighbourhood of people to do everything you need to do? Should you have sign up sheets to get people to like volunteer for different jobs? How would you organise the security and the farming? I couldn't stop thinking about it and it kept posing interesting dynamics dilemmas and situations and different things to organise, different things to plan. Like I said, I won't spoil anything, but it was just so interesting and intelligent and I just really enjoyed that. Maybe that sounds like hell to you, I don't know, but I loved it. I just really enjoyed it and when I got to the end of the book, I was really annoyed and sad because I was like, oh, I was enjoying that. It did end a little abruptly and I was like, no, I want to know more, I want to know what's going to happen next. It wasn't a cliffhanger, but it definitely leaves you wanting more and and I will have to get the rest of the books in this series. I think there's three books in this series, so two more. I will be getting those because I want to know what happens next and how else they're going to have to defend from and how they're going to progress their mini society and how they're going to protect it. So I really enjoyed it. Highly recommend. Matthew, this was a hole in one. Let me know, does that sound interesting to you? Does that sound fun? Or does like the whole analytical planning part make you think it sounds boring? I don't know. I thought it was really fun. It was really well weaved into the story. You know, that's what my mind took from it. You might read it and not even think to question and just enjoy the story and the characters and the plot. But it had all that extra moral intelligence spice that I could take away with me. So it was really fun. It really got my brain in gear and I had so, so much fun with it. And that's all you can ask for. So that was the book back in March that I didn't properly get to review for you. Now the other book I mentioned back in my March wrap up was My Life in Rugby by Eddie Jones. I started that right at the end of March. So I barely started it and I finished it in the end of April because not reading a lot apparently at the moment. <laughs> I really enjoyed this autobiography so I am an absolute rugby fan. Rugby is life. April was the month of the women's six nations so that was a great time. In fact the final is today. 
But it was so super interesting to read Eddie Jones' autobiography. I knew barely anything about the man and now I feel like I know way more and he talked through a lot of his decision makings in his career and I just found that whole thing really, really fascinating. So the book goes through his life and his early career, his early days playing for Ranwick, I think it was, in Australia, the rugby out there, then him coaching and building the school early on in his career. He was a teacher and he built this school with these other colleagues and they built this whole curriculum and school that wasn't very official and they had to get it all approved and that was very interesting and then it talked a lot about obviously rugby and his career as a coach him coaching for the Brumbies and then coaching for Australia going to Japan to coach for them and then coaching for England so it was really fun he describes a ton of rugby matches during the book super interesting to hear a manager describe a rugby match it was really fun to listen to a lot of the early rugby matches he described were really exciting because I didn't know what was going to happen and it was interesting and then as it got near the end of the book I was like oh I remember that match and then it got to the World Cup which was 2019 <laughs> ah yes 2019 <laughs> and it's just really interesting to listen to the rugby matches I've never seen and then kind of come into my era and then listen to the rugby matches that I actually watched when they were live Eddie Jones talked a lot about how he approaches the media and a lot of the strategy behind how he plans and how he coaches a lot of the players he talks about the early days he talked about a lot of players I have have no idea who they are and then towards the end of the book player names start coming in I'm like oh I know that one and all of the England players I know and love at the end of the book are there it was just a really fun listen for a person who loves rugby it was really fun I thought Eddie Jones seems like a really honest sincere hard-working guy I like the strategy and how he talked about how he faced the media and how he planned certain things the things that were true and the things that were not and how it kind of works more behind the scenes and the decisions that he has to make and why he talked to me through certain decisions he made that I was really curious about in recent years and now I understand why he did those things. It felt like a real inside peek to his life and how rugby works behind the curtain and I just had a ton of fun with it. If you don't like rugby then I know you're not going to read this book and you probably shouldn't because it will bore you to death but for me a rugby fan I absolutely loved it and I feel a lot more connected to Eddie Jones now and I really hope he stays on as England rugby coach for a little while because I know that he can bring England rugby to the top. I have absolutely faith in Eddie Jones I've always liked him as a manager and now I understand a lot of his decisions more I like him even more that was really fun for me it was a great audiobook did I mention I listened to it as an audiobook it was a really fun audiobook to listen to and I'm glad I got to it the first physical book I read in April was Surrender Your Sons also sent to me by Matthew I read through a lot of books sent to me by Matthew this month this book is about a teenage boy who gets sent to a pray the gay away type conversion therapy camp which yeah icky and it's like this dystopian horror about this boy and the experiences he has in this horrible camp. I enjoyed my time reading it. It was like a mix between YA rom-com and horror. It was an odd mix. The writing style definitely was a bit different. This book oozes creepiness. The conversion therapy camp was on this island and it was very creepy and disturbing. There was a lot of horrid imagery. There is so many trigger warnings, all kinds of abuse. Beware of that on all fronts going in. This book doesn't hold back any punches, which is what I looked for, so I enjoyed that. <laughs> the book also was so good at being very twisty and turny. A lot of the plot twists just kept on coming. I didn't see so many of the things that happened happening. And I think the plot lines were cleverly weaved together with the different characters. There's a lot of scenes I look back on that were really good and well described. You really get a vibe off this book, a really dark, sinister, but there's also a kind of quirky vibe to the book. There are a few negatives I have from this one. Mainly the writing style, like I said, wasn't exactly my cup of tea. I always struggle with trying to mash together absolute horror with really young sounding YA. <laughs> it was a weird mix but the thing that probably got me the most in this book and this gets me in a lot of books the decision making and the main character's thought process because why? So at the very beginning of the book our main character basically gets kidnapped out of his bed and they take him away to this conversion therapy camp and he reacts really weird to this scenario. So he's being forced out of his bed and and at first he's confused and angry and scared like what the fuck's going on appropriate reaction and then he finds out what's happening and he's angry and resentful at his horribly religious mother for condemning him to this horrible fate again appropriate reaction then they get to the airport and all of a sudden he's like yeah I'll just get on a plane with you on a commercial flight in the middle of an airport why not do you need to threaten my family or coerce me in any way nope I'll just get right on that plane and then as soon as we arrive I'll be scared again and I was a bit like 
Dude, for plot convenience, I get it, but that was your chance. Why didn't he try to escape at the place where he had the most opportunity to escape? In an airport with security and hundreds of people, he could have just screamed and being kidnapped and boom, that would have ended the book. <laughs> but why? The kidnappers didn't say, oh, if you don't do this, we'll kill your family or we'll hurt your friends. No, none of that happened. He just all of a sudden trusted them for a moment and walked through security. What? Why? <laughs> Like I said, it was a plot convenience thing. He needed to get on that plane for the book to work. But then again, you could have written it differently. Did he have to go to a different country? Did it have to be a commercial flight? Couldn't they have threatened him or coerced him in any way? Why was his emotions going from terrified, I don't want to do this to, yeah, right. You can't just flip back and forth. You have to develop into one. The natural progression, it just didn't seem natural. That's not how a person would react to the situation. They wouldn't just suddenly stop being scared at that exact moment when they could escape. and. Then then be scared again. So yeah, that kind of bugged me right at the beginning because I thought that no, that's not how a person would react. So that was a little frustrating because the whole time he was in this camp, I was like, how did you get yourself here? Why? <laughs> there was also a lot of other weird decisions he makes. Like he gets the ticket to go home. He's like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> Why? There was some decision making that I wasn't a fan of and the writing style was a little strange but it was a fun time, I really liked the concept, I loved the creepiness factor, the awful horror of it, some of the things that this camp was doing was so gross and that was what I signed up for. My favourite characters were probably Darcy and I think it's pronounced Lucretia, I probably said that horribly wrong, but Darcy and Lucretia, even Molly, pay up for the women in this book. They were the only characters I was like, yes, you have brain, you have brain and head, you lead this situation because Molly's trying to escape totally makes sense. Darcy actually has some strategic thinking going on. She has a plan. The women in this story actually knew what they were doing and didn't make odd decisions so they were my favourite characters. <laughs> Especially Darcy. We like a person who thinks and plans has strategy. We like that. <laughs> Another good thing about this book is there was a lot of representation for different aspects of the gay spectrum. Obviously in the gay conversion cap there was all sorts of different kind of gays. We had Lucretia representing bi. We also had a trans trans character, although I wish the trans character had been more involved, they were mentioned and it was kind of been like, oh yeah, that one's trans by the way. We didn't really delve into that character and I think that was kind of a missed opportunity. So I would have loved the book to really have that be more of a character because I don't even remember their name or could tell you anything about them, just except they were trans and they were there. That could have been better. But the ending was really good, the plot twist, the wham bam bam kept coming and the ending gave you all the heart warm fuzzies. There was a lot of fallout from what happened in the story. Not everything ended up hunky-dory in the end, so there was some realism in that. But I did really enjoy the ending of this book, like the epilogue, I suppose you'd call it. It didn't say epilogue, but that's what I'm thinking of it as. Went into the detail of really everything that happened after this whole thing happens, and I really enjoyed the where they are now type thing. A lot of that was really delved into and explained, and I enjoyed that a lot. I hate it when books end off and don't tell you where the characters end up or how they feel in the end. It just kind of cuts the book. So I'm glad that that I got the sense of closure I was hoping for and that the characters ended off where they did. I really enjoyed that. This book had its positives and it had its negatives so I kind of have mixed feelings about it but overall I enjoyed it. It was a good story. I had fun. This book is just beautiful and stunning and I'm glad I read it. Okay so the next physical book and the last book I really read in April I have started another audiobook but this is near the end of April now and I'm probably not gonna get to finish it. It's gonna be another Eddie Jones situation I think. We won't talk about that one just yet the last physical read I read, book number three, and that is The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by B. E. Schwab. Another book that Matthew sent me because this was the month of Matthew. B. E. Schwab is life. I absolutely adore that woman. Her Instagram is just pure poetry. <laughs> On a serious note though, I find Victoria Schwab an extremely inspirational person. I love her. I love her personality. I love her words. I love her brain. And this book I've been dying to read ever since it's come out. I know that everyone else has probably read it already. I'm so late to this party, but I don't even care. The hype has now died down. I finally got to read this book and I loved it. Of course I did. There is no surprises to be had. I absolutely loved it. I mean, you already know what 
what this is about most probably but quick synopsis this is about a girl called Addie LaRue who was born in 17 something I can't remember and she basically makes the deal with the dark it's this dark mysterious figure is he the devil is he a demon is he a god you don't really know what he is and she makes a deal with him in her desperation to get away from this wedding that she doesn't want to be the bride of and she makes this deal which it comes with its price and that price is that she'll get to live forever and go off and be free and to live but no one will ever remember her and everyone in her life at that point forgets her as soon as they turn away from her or stop talking to her they'll immediately forget who she is so now she is alone in the universe to just wander for however many centuries completely alone without the ability to make any meaningful connections and now that is until the day in the modern era in 2014 where she walks into a bookshop and a boy remembers who she is and that sets into motion the events of the story this book kind of has a dual timeline it has the timeline in the past where Addie is living figuring out her blessing slash curse and going through the different eras of history and how she got to where she is in the present and then the present day where she is living her life and then bumping into this mysterious boy who knows her name. This book was brilliant. It was written so beautifully, like the words. Mm. This is the definition of word porn. It was so beyond beautifully written and every page was just a joy to read. I loved the story, the timeline from the past and the present. It was so interesting how they led up to each other. She talks a lot in retrospect. So she was say in the past like oh this happened little did I know that the future so it's kind of like she's reflecting back on that past which was a really interesting tense to use I found the mysterious figure really interesting and it was dark and the characters just had so much heart both Addie and Henry were great main characters and also Luke great characters in the story and it was just a beautifully written tale that had so much soul to it it really talked about the life lessons of what is living if you are completely alone and other such lessons from the blessing or curse that Addie made and it was very philosophical, very beautiful, very interesting. It talks a lot about art and making an impression on the world and how we connect to other people, how we feel about ourselves. Are you even living if no one knows who you are if you can't make a dent in this world? It was incredibly beautiful. There was also these bits at the beginning of the different parts of the book where it would show an art piece and it would describe it and they were loosely related to Addie in some way and I loved those, those were really good. The ending of the book had loads of great twists and I loved the way the plot went and what was actually happening, why and how the characters went about solving this. There were definite things I didn't see coming. I just thought it was a really beautiful story and the ending was just perfect and I can't believe I didn't see what it turned into. I was like, oh, it all wraps up so perfectly in a bow, doesn't it? It leaves you on a little bit of a mystery to kind of make up your own mind how the rest of the future could go, but I got the full closure and it was just a brilliant story. Beatty Schwab is one of my absolute favourite authors. I have loved every book of hers I've read so far. Some of them more than others but I just love Beatty Schwab. I think she's a great writer, a great soul and I just absolutely adore the woman. The only problem I did have while reading this book was before I read it, of course, this book is one of the most hyped books ever. There's a lot of people that love this book. Obviously this book is a major seller and so many people adore this book. However, with a book that's this popular popular and this in the public eye there's always going to be people who don't like the book and there's a few people that I heard the negative comments about the book and while I was reading the book I disagreed with some of those negative comments but they were in there and you know when those negative comments niggle their way into your brain they won't leave you alone the negative comments I heard about this book I wanted to just control log delete them from my memory I couldn't and that was just really really frustrating to me because I had that in my head the whole way I was reading through the book and it kept coming back. I don't know why I couldn't just let those comments go but they wouldn't leave me alone and I feel like that dulled my experience in a way. I don't know it sounds stupid to say but because these people had these comments and I couldn't stop thinking about that it made the experience less fun for me. I think if I hadn't have heard those comments I would have loved this book so wholeheartedly and I would have just fully loved my time with it whereas in because I heard those negative I kept reading the book and thinking no this book is good like it is good and I kept having to I know validate and convince myself that this was good and that I could like it and that I was allowed to like it even though these certain people didn't like it I don't know it's weird I think as well what makes it worse is that some of the comments I understood where they were coming from I'm 
gonna try and delete these from memory. I guess that's the lesson to learn with art is that because it's so subjective not everyone can love it and that's the reason that I am too terrified to write my own book. I've always wanted to write my own novel and I've written things before but I'm not sure if I could ever become an author because no matter how hard you work, no matter how much blood, sweat, tears and soul you put into a story, there are going to be people that hate it and there are going to be people that hate you by proxy. That whole idea stresses me out. Like Vida Schwab is such a good author. You don't have to love her books like I do. Am I making any sense or has my brain melted out of my ears? I'm tired. <laughs> love this story and I'm so glad that Vida Schwab got this book that she'd been working on for years and years and years. This one that lived in her brain and her soul for so long out onto the page and into my hands and I absolutely loved it. Now I guess I have to get to more of her books like the villain series need to get to that. And those are all the books I read in April. Now I have started one book and I have a lot of opinions on it already. However I probably will review it in a different video or in next month's wrap up because I am only at the beginning so I think maybe my opinions could change. If I review it now I won't give it that justice that it deserves. You know you should always finish a book before you review it. I'll tell you what the book is. That is Yes No Maybe So by Becky Albertalli and Aisha Saeed. That's off the top of my head. Please don't be wrong. I'm listening to that as an audiobook from my library. Who knows I might finish it before April. I'm enjoying it. I have a lot of things to talk about with that one. I will see you in next month's wrap up in the May wrap up for that. Well thank you for coming along to my April wrap up. I managed to get this filmed. My boyfriend's birthday but he's out for an hour drinking with his friends so I managed to get this filmed and I'm working all week so we did it guys. This was a tight one. <laughs> Can I edit it in time though? Thank you for watching, like the video. If you enjoyed it, talk to me in the comments about any of these books. Have you read any of them? Probably you might have read Addy. What do you think? Do you think it's worth the hype? Do you like Victoria Schwab? Thank you for watching my wrap up. Talk to me in the comments about literally anything, to be honest, because I love you and I love chatting to you. And subscribe to this channel if you're not. I have some cool series ideas that I'm gonna be doing on this channel, so I hope you are here for them. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video. Bye.